Thank you. I am delighted to see, to see you here this evening for our very first community conversation on criminal justice yesterday and today. And even as I say those words, I have to say that I imagine that you are all here because you're speaking and participating, um, but because you know that this is a rich topic and is one that also could be a very challenging topic. And you're here in a public library because perhaps you recognize that that is genuinely an appropriate space for us to have this type of conversation. Okay, you know, you, you all, many of you told me how you are very happy with the Austin Public Library, yay. You, um, you use these services here, and so you know that no matter what media what libraries are working in, whether it's books or DVDs or movies or whatever, that what we are here to do is basically threefold. We're here to answer your questions, to provide information to all of you, to whatever question you actually have of you in the moment. We're also here to provide opportunities for enrichment. Okay, libraries are here so that you can be a lifelong learner in truth. You can be self-directed to learn whatever it is that motivates you right now, but also to come together in classes and in workshops and in, and in events like this to learn something new. And that's what that brings me to the third thing that we do. We offer opportunities for engagement. You are connecting with other members of your community, with the experts that we've managed to bring here today, to gain perspective. So at the end of the day, you're going to walk out of here, usually with an armload of books, right, and a couple of DVDs, but you're going to walk out of here also with new knowledge and new perspective. How cool that libraries can actually offer that. Because I am confident that you will leave here wanting to know more, I want to refer you to the lovely brochure that we've created for this program series. At the very bottom of this brochure, there is an address for a website. I, I know, know what the address is because I built it. It's conversations.westchesterlibraries.org. <coughs> At that website, you're going to find reading lists and viewing lists. There is so much more to consider about this topic. So we just kind of you know, started a list that we think of are particularly good things for you to be aware of. Additionally, if you open up the brochure, you know that these conversations are going to take place throughout the month of October. They're at six locations, and each location has a different set of panelists. What that means is that what we share and what we learn is going to be a little bit different at each location. So unless you're going to collect them all and come to each and every event, what I invite you to do is to go to the website. We're going to post two things, actually three things. We're going to post highlights from each of these conversations. We we'll have the benefit of being able to post video clips from any of these conversations. And also, we're going to have Q&A at the end. Uh, and we may not get to address all of the questions that you have. If you have questions, you're going to have an opportunity to have index cards and you know, pencils and pens if you, if you don't have it handy. Write your questions down, and we'll do our best to, to address them. But this is a rich topic. So if we don't get to them all, we'll have those answers and those questions posted at conversations.westchesterlibraries.org. Um, I also wanted to say that this is a particularly delicious opportunity for me. I am, I didn't even introduce myself, I am Elena Falcone, the Director of Public Innovation and Engagement at the Westchester Library System. So my job is, is uh, one where I do outreach programs around the county. Part of my work is to do programs that particularly target a re-entry audience. So by re-entry, I mean any of those who are coming out of jail or prison, anyone who's done a period of incarceration and is reconnecting into our, our communities. Those individuals have a number of challenges ahead of them. And we have information resources. I actually have a web portal called, um, called connections.westchesterlibraries.org. It's called the Westchester Connections Guide. And information on that portal and other services that we have to help people get their high school equivalency diploma, to help people get, get a job. All of that information is available over there, as well as information from the other organizations you're going to be hearing, hearing from today. So there's information galore. It's all, it's all, it's all there. The, an effort like this, I just have to say, to do this over the course of, of October and bring all these people together, it truly does take a village. It, it, um, we, have, we have the village of Austin participating today. And we also have other member libraries, New Rochelle, Mount Kisco, uh, Yonkers, and I'm going to forget one, Pat. Shrubo, thank you. So across across the county. Additionally, we have the, well, the, uh, the funding of the Westchester Community Foundation, who you're about, about to hear from. And we have the wonderful work in partnership with the Sing Sing Prison Museum and Historic Hudson Dallas. So how delightful to have all of these folks come together. My thanks, my thanks to them on behalf of the Westchester Library System. And my thanks to all of you for making the time this evening to come together and learn together. 
That is what libraries are for, and you are now part of it. So with that, I'm going to introduce Robin Moline, who is from the Westchester Community Foundation, and then she'll, she'll get us going. Thank you, Elena. Uh, as I said, I'm Robin Moline from the Westchester Community Foundation. We have been working with donors and nonprofits around the county for more than 40 years to help make it out. Sorry, I'm over in a long time. Uh, we've worked in the county for more than 40 years. <laughs> we have worked in the county for more than 40 years uh, with nonprofits and donors to help really make the quality of life much better in, in Westchester. Um, we've been com committed to criminal justice reform for many years. We've done programs called the Community Matters Program at uh, Jacob Burns Film Center where we've done four films on various topics from the parenting program at Bedford Hills Correctional to the theater program at Sing Sing to gun control and community policing. Um, and our grants program has supported reentry services for women at, uh, coming out of the, uh, the Westchester County Jail. We've done advocacy for the Raise the Age legislation, which passed. And we've been funding a promising program for young men at the Westchester County uh, Youth Shelter Program in Mount Vernon. When the folks from the new museum, uh, the Sing Sing Museum, approached us about supporting them, we asked them some hard questions. What's the focus of the museum? Who would benefit? You name Osney, others? And how would it inform the conversations that we've been encouraging about criminal justice and criminal justice reform? When we met Brent, something resonated. Uh, Brent explained that his approach in developing this museum is grounded in the knowledge that we cannot move forward if we don't look back and understand the history that lies behind it. That caught our attention. We asked Brent and his team what his needs were, and that led to an introdu introduction to the Westchester Library System with the thought that this series of programs around Westchester would accomplish two things continue the dialogue around criminal justice reform and hold up what's working in the, in the criminal justice system, and in particular at Sing Sing Museum. So we are often careful about such matchmaking, but I'm thrilled to say that the teams at the library and the museum work together to create this program, which I think is going to be really something. So I'm going to turn it over to Brent. Is that right? This is Brent Glass, Senior Advisor to the Sing Sing Museum. Thank you, Thank you Robin. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, in Austin. I see many familiar faces and friendly faces and some new faces, which is great. Um, I think we have a great program for you tonight. Very, you're really at the start of something historic. Uh, because we're going, this is the first of six programs, as Robin described, these the conversations. And we have just the right number of people for a conversation here. So we, we will, you'll, you'll learn a lot, I hope. Uh, you'll maybe be challenged to think about some familiar uh, subjects in a new way. Uh, and then I hope you will uh, challenge us and, uh, with your questions and with your comments. So think of this next hour and a half as a as part seminar and part, le uh, part uh, uh, conversation and discussion, and I'm really pleased to get, to get started. I want to first thank the Westchester Community Foundation. Laura Rossi is here, the executive director. You've heard from Robin. Uh, they've had the vision to, as, uh, as Robin put it, marry the Simpson Prison Museum uh, with uh, the uh, Westchester uh, library system, and I think it's been so far, a successful marriage. We're just in our, our, our uh, honeymoon, I guess, but uh, uh, talk to us in a month from now, and I think you'll see that it, it's been very successful. I want to thank Pat Brigham and also Elena Falcone for uh, uh, being our partners uh, because they've done a wonderful job, and I, I congratulate them, and I think uh, the Austin uh, uh, Public Library also deserves our, our thanks as well. I want to recognize some people who are 
also involved with the, uh, with the Simpson Prison Museum. We have several board members here. Our chair, Robert uh, Bob Elliott, is here. Uh, our uh, our um, treasurer, uh, Abby uh, Lewis, is here. Our secretary, Sean Pika, is here. Um, Rochelle Udell, I saw earlier. Rochelle is here. Uh, Nancy Gold, who's our media uh, specialist. So we've got good representation. And also our ex official members, <coughs> uh, Assemblywoman uh, Sandy Galef is here. And, and uh, Sandy has been outstanding in helping us navigate through the, the corridors of uh, state grant making and state uh, funding. So uh, we're really delighted that, uh, that you're here. Mayor uh, Garrity, Victoria Garrity is here. And, her, and she and her staff have been terrific in uh, providing, I can't uh, name how many hours of uh, in-kind uh, support uh, for which we really needed, even getting us a truck uh, at one point, a lift to get our uh, architectural uh, experts into the uh, powerhouse and cell block. Uh, they arranged that and uh, I don't know uh, what that would have cost us uh, on the outside, so thank you for all of that, uh, all that work. Uh, Westchester County has provided us with uh, great support, the township uh, also of, of Ossining. So there's a real team effort from the public sector, and I shouldn't leave out the Department of Corrections. Uh, Art Wolf Walfinski is here, I think. Art is right there. Uh, but Superintendent uh, Mike Capra has embraced this idea of a museum. Uh, he has given it full support. He's given us access uh, for people who want to see the historic powerhouse and also the, the historic 1825 cell block. And without uh, Superintendent Capra's uh, support and vision, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't even be talking about uh, a prison museum at this point. And not only uh, Superintendent Capra, but also a number of his colleagues in, uh, in Albany as well. So uh, from the public sector, uh, you, you couldn't get a better uh, starting point, a better uh, um, cross-the-board interagency support for this, uh, for this idea. Um, tonight, I'm going to provide a, just a few introductory comments about the museum. Then I'm going to introduce Dana White, who is also a member of our board. Uh, did I, I didn't mention that, but Dana, I was going to in, our, in her introduction. She's also the historian of the village of, of Austin, and she'll talk a little bit about history. And then we have three experts uh, on a panel who will talk about um, their particular uh, connection to this subject of criminal justice. And there are three very different uh, perspectives that you'll hear. And this subject is so complex. There are so many different subcategories uh, of criminal justice that you can't cover it all in one night. So we will have three experts from, the, from certain perspectives but we don't uh, in any way want to pre uh, present the idea that this is an encyclopedic uh, look at the, uh, at the subject. But it is a rich subject, as Robin said, uh, and as Elena said, and so we want to get started uh, with, with that, with that uh, discussion. This museum is, is going to be typical in some ways, but it's not going to be your grandfather's museum. It's going to be, it will have collections, it will have exhibitions, there will be uh, programs, uh, public programs. There will be tours of the uh, powerhouse uh, built in 1936, and also tours of the, of the cell block built in 1825. But this museum will be different in many ways. It will be based at a maximum security prison. There's no other museum, prison museum like it in the country. Uh, it will be located at uh, this prison on, on the Hudson River, um, and uh, where it has been for 200 years. And by having access to the historic cell block, we will be giving people access to one of the most important institutional, historic institutional buildings uh, in the country. My, my research has shown that this probably, when it was built in 1825, was the largest building in the United States. It was even bigger than the US Capitol. Uh, and if I'm wrong, uh, somebody will do the research and tell me that I'm wrong. But right now, I'm, I'm holding, I'm, that's my opinion, and I'm, I'm holding to it. Um, I've mentioned the, the, the public support that we've received. Uh, also, the private support uh, from uh, board members, uh, from individuals in the community, and from the Westchester Community Foundation. And there are several other uh, potential uh, private sources that are, are uh, considering 
uh, supporting this, this effort. Uh, the other unique aspect of this uh, museum will be that we are uh, establishing partnerships with organizations uh, throughout the region and even around the country who have a, a long-standing uh, impact uh, either as advocacy organizations or service organizations or educational organizations on the subject of criminal justice. You'll hear tonight from Sean Pika about the Hudson Link uh, uh, Program for Higher Education in Prison. Um, the Rehabilitation uh, Through the Arts is another uh, partnership that we're developing. We've talked to the Fortune Society, the Greenberger Center. You will hear from Cheryl Roberts tonight about the Greenberger Center. Uh, the Vera Institute we've talked to, um, John Jay College, uh, um, the uh, Bethany Arts uh, program that's developing here in Ossining, um, uh, partners at Alcatraz Island in San Francisco, uh, the uh, Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site in Philadelphia. We envision this uh, museum to be a storytelling uh, place, a place to tell the story of criminal justice at Sing Sing over 200 years, but also to tell the story of the culture of reform that is taking place at Sing Sing and at other places uh, around New York and around the country. So the museum will be a traditional museum in that respect, but it will also be uh, a place that will showcase uh, the culture of reform. Uh, and I always uh, think uh, about uh, the gentleman, Sean, from, uh, who attended one of our programs, uh, John, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name, but he, we were talking about capital punishment. And we were talking about the fact that 614 people were executed at Simpson. And the fact that we will show, we will have a, a gallery about uh, that subject uh, and probably have uh, the electric chair on display. And he said, you know, I hope this museum is not about old sparking, but, we'll, but the museum will spark an interest in education about what's going, will educate people about what is going on at Simpson today. And I think that statement really stuck with all of us, that that's our charge. It's not just to talk about the history, which is, which is a, which uh, you'll hear from Dana White, which is a, uh, a, a brutal history in many respects, but there's also a history about reform uh, that we want to showcase as well. Um, we have four goals. They're not modest goals, but uh, I just want to mention them uh, briefly. We want to be the best prison museum in the United States. And every chapter in the history of criminal justice in this country, every chapter has a few pages written at Sing Sing Prison. So we want to uh, talk about that history. We want to uh, participate in the national conversation on criminal justice, especially the subject of reentry, because uh, Superintendent Capra has asked us specifically, would there be room in the museum for programs related to the subject of, of reentry, and you'll hear uh, more about that um, later uh, this evening. Uh, the third uh, goal we have is to have a positive economic impact on the village of Ossining and the region. We anticipate that there will be 130,000 visitors to uh, this, this museum based on our uh, evaluations, and that will have um, an impact of more than $10 million a year in spending by visitors and by um, the other uh, measures uh, that, that you can use to, to measure the impact of a museum of this kind. So, we, so we're very uh, mindful of, of the economic <coughs> ramifications of a museum uh, here in Austin. And the fourth goal we have is to have a positive impact on the prisoners, uh, the prison workers, the victims, uh, and victims of crime and their families. So that's a, another uh, major goal that we have. Um, we plan to begin construction next year uh, with, the, uh, with the hope that we will raise about $625,000 in private funds. That will generate uh, more than $3 million in state funding, uh, thanks to uh, Assemblywoman Galef and also Senator uh, um, David Carlucci. Um, uh, they have been able to uh, help us uh, generate uh, that kind of state spending 
Plus, we've done some, some very good grantsmanship on our own uh, to uh, secure some of that funding. So we plan to start next year. We plan to open our first phase by 2020, and we hope to have the entire museum open in time for the 200th anniversary of the 1825 cell block by 2025. Now, you may sit there and say, wow, 2025 is a long time from now. Believe me, in museum time, that is very soon. Uh, so we have to get, we're, 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 we have to have a sense of urgency here to keep this, to keep the momentum that we have and keep it going. And we're very confident that we will. Um, I'm now pleased to uh, introduce Dana White. Uh, and I think it's appropriate for us to start with history. Um, and Dana, as the village historian uh, here in Ossining, has is, is done tremendous work uh, on uh, putting together a narrative about uh, the uh, about the history of the of the, uh, of the of the prison. I guess I should, but while Dana's getting uh, set up there, I should run through just a couple of images I want to show you. I almost forgot my own program here. Um, our plan is to. Uh, Yes, here's the powerhouse, uh, which is on the outside of the prison walls. So the powerhouse is about 30,000 square feet, and on each level we will have, um, uh, I've got the, uh, um, let me back. So on each level there will be uh, exhibitions on the top, on the top floor, there is room for us to have a conference center, uh, which we are calling an Institute for Criminal Justice. Uh, that will be a place where you can have conferences and meetings, but our Institute for Criminal Justice can take place, and uh, programs uh, under this institute can take place all over Austin, all over Westchester County, all over the country. And so, but it will be based and headquartered uh, here in Austin. Uh, our plan is to construct a 400-foot secure corridor from the powerhouse to the historic 1825 cell block. The cell block is 476 feet long, so we don't need to bring visitors into the entire building. But we envision that we will build some kind of structure. You see something here that's just a rendering. But something that would bring people in about 100 feet into the cell block, and then we would have exhibitions and also a view into the rest of the structure. This is probably one of the most extraordinary uh, buildings uh, in the country. And we need to uh, bring people into this into this uh, uh, structure to give them the full appreciation of the history of what life was like for 1,200 uh, men uh, during the uh, period of incarceration from 1825 to the 1940s. And Daniel's going to talk about that. I should also mention that the powerhouse is about a 10-minute walk from the Ossining train station. So we're going to be encouraging. Uh, visitors from New York and from around the metropolitan area to arrive here by train as much as possible. It's also not that far from the ferry slip um, that is served from Havistraw. So we're looking at um, multiple ways of bringing people uh, to, to this museum. There's room for about 80 uh, parking spaces around the museum, which on a normal weekday will be adequate, we believe. And on weekends, when commuters are not uh, using the parking lots uh, for the train uh, station, there will be uh, more, more parking available uh, there as well. The powerhouse is, a, is built in 1936. It's a, uh, an amazing uh, building, and, and that will be interpreted as well as being the home uh, uh, and headquarters for the museum. Um, this is a, a perspective of the powerhouse showing some of the ways it could be used in the future. Uh, the historic cell block I mentioned before. I should also mention next door to the cell block is a gymnasium that was built in 1934 by Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers built this gymnasium because they had made so many films, uh, gangster films in the uh, 1920s and 30s that they, they built the gymnasium to honor one of the uh, children uh, of, the, of the original Warner Brothers who had died uh, at, as, at a young age. And then next door, I don't know why this is next to the next. To, you're looking now from the south going north in the cell block. 
and this is our information. We have offices on Main Street, um, and um, we welcome visitors to our um, Facebook page and also to our uh, website, um, and that's the email address. And I'm going to turn this over to you. I don't know why it's advancing so. Well. No, but I'm going to use her relentlessly. Thanks, Brent. <clears throat> Sing Sing, from House of Fear to a Chance at Hope. Sing Sing Correctional Facility is a maximum security prison where the theories and realities of incarceration have played out for almost 200 years. The ruins of the 1825 cell block are all that's left of the 19th century prison complex. This six-story limestone shell sits on the west side of the Metro North tracks, parallel to the Hudson River. It is 476 feet long by 44 feet wide, and at one time contained 1,200 cells. It was a laboratory of sorts, a 120-year experiment in confining and managing convicted criminals. Each cell was minuscule, three feet four inches wide by seven feet deep, not much bigger than your average yoga mat. These cells, their claustrophobia, their hideous discomforts, epitomized the harshness of prison life. These were the dimensions of what a democratic society would tolerate at the time. We had a map made to the exact measurements of a cell in the 1825 cell block. My friend Mark laid on it, and he's six feet tall. Now imagine being confined to that cell every night and for 20 hours on Sunday. Imagine two men in that cell, which was not uncommon. That's a dummy on the left fabricated for an escape attempt. Sing Sing, of course, is part of popular culture with its own mythology, lexicon, and lore. But to focus on the sensational stuff, the notorious inmates, the cinematic history, Babe Ruth's monster home run over the prison wall, only obscures the evolution that has taken place there. Former Sing Sing Superintendent Brian Fisher, who ran the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision for six years, puts it this way, our prisons have been changing since the day we created them, and they will continue to change. In colonial America, you were far more likely to be put to death than to be put in jail for a crime. Many offenses qualified for the death penalty, from witchcraft to treason to picking flowers from your neighbor's garden. That was Jamestown. Even if your life was spared, punishments were cruel and public. The Pennsylvania Quakers had a more progressive idea. Don't kill criminals, reform them. In Philadelphia, the 18th century Walnut Street prison followed the traditional British model. Men, women, and children in large rooms together, free to mingle and explore their vices. The Quakers built a section of individual cells, a cell block, where the worst offenders were kept in isolation, away from corrupting influences. In the Philadelphia or separate system, inmates were isolated in their cells for 24 hours a day, never seeing or speaking to another human being. Theoretically, this gave them time to reflect on their crimes and become penitent or regretful for what they had done and to vow to reform their ways upon release, thus the term penitentiary. The first state prison in New York was Newgate, built in Greenwich Village in 1797. It was founded on Quaker principles of reformation, but prisoners mingled in large rooms, not separate cells, and Newgate quickly became chaotic. With crime on the rise after the War of 1812, construction of a second state prison began in upstate New York in 1816. The worst offenders were kept in solitary confinement, a la the Pennsylvania system, but the complete and utter isolation drove the men to self-harming and suicide. Nevertheless, the Auburn cell block, long tiers of tiny cells contained within a stone superstructure, along with the striped suits, lockstep march, and forced labor, would become the template for prisons around the nation. Auburn is marking its 200th anniversary this year as a working institution. 
Auburn's second warden, a former army officer named Elam Limbs, decided prison should be a place not of redemption, but of punishment and fear. Inmates slept in their cells, but worked together in factories during the day, forbidden to speak or look at each other. In 1819, an act of the New York State Legislature legalized flogging at the state prisons, and Linz and his keepers used the cat of nine tails to maintain order. In 1824, the village of Sing Sing was chosen as the location for a third state prison, which would replace Newgate. It was close to New York City, had a convenient riverfront location, and large deposits of limestone, nicknamed Sing Sing Marble, that would provide the building material for the new prison. You can still see large outcroppings of it outside the prison walls. The plans show a massive structure of brutal minimalism. Modeled after Auburn's North Wing, it would be the largest cell block in the world, the first to truly put the mass in mass incarceration. In the spring of 1825, Elam Lenz and 100 Auburn prisoners traveled down river to Sing Sing. They set up camp and set to work, quarrying, moving, shaping, and mortaring the stone into place, in all weather, underfed, under constant threat of the lash. The convicts completed the first level by the first snow and were locked inside cells of their own making. They were let out at dawn to keep building. One particularly ingenious prisoner created the innovative door locking system, which allowed 50 cells to be barred at once. The state called the prison Mount Pleasant after the surrounding township. Four levels were completed by January of 1828. Two more levels were added later. With a capacity for 1,200 inmates, this single building held more people than the hub and spoke design of the new penitentiary in Philadelphia, which had much larger and better appointed cells. Cherry Hill replaced Walnut Street Prison in 1829. Later renamed Eastern State, the penitentiary mandated the inmates be led to their cells wearing hoods. In 1831, a Frenchman named Alexis de Tocqueville toured America as part of a fact-finding mission into the young democracy, including its two competing prison philosophies. De Tocqueville was appalled by the brutality of the Auburn system. While society in the United States is the example of the most extended liberty, he wrote, the prisons of the same country offer the spectacle of the most complete despotism. In the 1830s, other buildings went up at Mount Pleasant State Prison, a hospital, a mess hall, laundry, a warden's house, and workshops where inmates made goods for the open market at a fraction of the cost of civilian laborers. They also quarried the stone for sale up and down the river. State prisons were expected to be financially self-sufficient and even turn a profit. After flogging was outlawed in 1840, the state reached back to its cruel colonial roots for new forms of punishment. The Iron Crown was a sadistic birdcage bolted to the neck. Keepers hung convicts by their wrists and thumbs. In the shower bath, a prisoner was tied into stocks and gallons of cold water poured over his head until he was half drowned, a la waterboarding. Several prisoners were known to have died. Mount Pleasant more than earned its nickname, the House of Fear. As one early warden put it, the best prison is that which the inmates <clears throat> find worst. Now imagine you were a woman. Small numbers of female convicts were kept in the state prisons in an attic at Auburn and in a special section of the cell block at Sing Sing. In 1826, after a female convict at Auburn was impregnated and flogged to death, though she lived long enough to deliver her child, the voices of reform demanded change. That change was the first cell block in the nation built specifically to hold female convicts. It was opened in 1839 and closed in 1877. It sat on a hill above the rest of the prison, a beautiful Greek revival structure that held 120 women. This illustration shows its location relative to the rest of the prison complex in the 1870s. You can see it up, up there, right? On the quarry behind it. So the men had to walk past the women's prison to get to work. You'll notice that unlike the lower prison, the female prison has a wall around it. 
The inmates were mostly thieves, though there were a handful of lifers who had killed their husbands and poisoned their children. There was a prison nursery, the first of its kind. Female sinners were considered traitors to their gender, since their baser impulses had overruled their feminine virtues. They were deemed irredeemable. The experiment did not go well at first. Harsh discipline and riots were rife. In 1844, reformers convinced the legislature to hire Elizabeth Farnham, a progressive thinker, author, and early feminist from upstate New York. She believed that moral character could be assessed by reading the bumps on a person's head, a pseudoscience called phrenology. She treated the women with dignity and kindness, and they repaid her with order. But her ideas were too radical, and Farnham was eventually forced to resign. But she remains an example of the strong, fearless women who advocated for prison reform in the 18th and 19th centuries. Activists like Elizabeth Fry and Mary Carpenter in England, and Dorothea Dix and Maud Bollington Booth in this country. In 1848, the Hudson River Railroad arrived in Sing Sing. The tracks were laid straight through the prison grounds. The state changed the prison's name from Mount Pleasant to Sing Sing. The local citizenry cried foul, claiming their village name had been stolen. The juxtaposition of state-sanctioned torture, corruption scandals, and this oddly musical name was catnip to newspaper reporters. Sing Sing, after all, was only 30 miles north of the media capital of the world. The city provided both the convicts and the news coverage of those convicts. Sketch artists for weekly magazines offered readers a look inside the prison. For 25 cents, anyone was allowed onto the prison grounds to watch the convicts work through special peepholes. This was the case at Auburn as well, and at Clinton, the third state prison that opened in 1844 in Danamora, where inmates worked the mines. Escapes were constant. Indeed, you could not have designed a prison more conducive to sneaking out of, with no wall around it, a railroad running through it, and boats regularly arriving and leaving from its wharf. The convicts hijacked passing trains with disconcerting frequency always the southbound engine, in hopes it would take them back to the city. These incidents naturally upset the citizenry, who created a special brigade to protect the village. Others hunted the escapees in hopes of getting the $50 bounty. A perimeter wall was finally built in 1877, though it didn't help much. The papers thrived on scandal. It's true, keepers and guards could be corrupted, but it was a dangerous and demanding job. Keepers were unarmed, outnumbered, and attacked. Three prison officers have been killed during escape attempts in the line of duty. Keeper Edwin Kraft in 1845, Keeper Daniel McCarthy in 1916, and guard John Hartley in 1941. A village police officer named James Fagan also lost his life that night. Sing Sing Corrections officers salute these fallen heroes every year. Over the decades, Sing Sing Prison became an industrial village. Inmates turned out all types of goods, from saddles to stoves to shoes. In the 1880s, under pressure from labor unions, the state began to dismantle the contract labor system. New education programs were instituted, such as a night school for illiterate inmates. They studied by lamplight, but a world-changing innovation was just around the corner. Old Sparky, the bastard child of the electric age, arrived at all three state prisons in 1890, along with the coal-fed dynamos that powered them. The electric chair was considered a more modern and private capital punishment than public hanging, which usually happened in the city. The first executions were carried out in Sing Sing Prison on July 7, 1891. Four men went to the chair, one after another. It took an hour and 25 minutes altogether. Executions took place several times a month and were reported around the world. The New York World called it the fair, sweet mercy of electric death. But for Sing Sing citizens, the electric chair was the final straw. The village had prospered from jobs and commerce the prison provided, but they were over the stigma. Ideally, they wanted the prison closed, and it almost was. Finally, in 1901, the governor of New York agreed to change its name to Ossining, and there was joy in Sing Sing Village. 
Seventy years later, the prison was renamed again to Austin Correctional Facility. <laughs> Whoops. Fifteen years after that, at the request of the Austin Village Board, the name was changed back to Sing Sing Correctional Facility. And so it remains to this day. After 1913, all electrocutions in the New York State took place at Sing Sing. The era of the electric chair at Sing Sing lasted from 1891 to, 19, to 1963. 600 <coughs> people died there, the most in one year, 21 in 1936, the most at one time, seven on August 12, 1912. Eight were women. Photographers were banned, but in 1928, a reporter strapped a camera to his leg and took this image of husband killer Ruth Snyder at the moment of death. The sensational image shocked and enthralled the world, as did the depravity of Albert Fish, considered the country's first serial killer, who raped, murdered, and cannibalized a 10-year-old girl named Grace Budd, as did the amorality of Louis Lepke Buckalter, who headed the mafia hit squad called Murder, Inc., as did the Cold War martyrdom of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, convicted of passing atomic secrets to the Soviet Union. Ironically, as the dark work of the electric chair continued, the state tried to soften conditions for the rest of its inmates. Key reforms of the 20th century included abolition of the striped uniforms and the lockstep. The convicts got more physical activity and a fairer parole system. The cell block got large windows for better ventilation, though it only succeeded in letting more rats in. The old punishments were banned. Discipline was not meted out primarily in the hated Discipline was now meted out primarily in the hated dark cells or dungeon, pitch black isolation and little food. The inmates still worked making items for the state, not for the free market, things like mattresses and American flags. But a surge in city crime meant that a facility built for 1200 was holding twice that, and there wasn't enough work for everyone, which meant the men spent more time cooped up in those tiny cells often with a roommate. Riots and insurrection ensued. Factories were burned. Sing Sing was in crisis, beset by scandal, chaos, and decay. Just close it down already, people said. And they almost did. The man brought in to fix the problem was Thomas Mott Osborne, a millionaire and politician from Auburn. Osborne came from a socially progressive family and had a passion for prison reform. He brought a rare element to prison operations, empathy. He earned this empathy in 1913 after spending a week undercover in Auburn as a felon named Tom Brown. It's actually him in the back, right there where that arrow is. His book about that experience made him famous. He established at Auburn a milestone in penal reform, the Mutual Welfare League, a system of convict self-governance that gave the inmates a sense of hope and control over their own destinies. The League had its own court system, even its own currency. Its motto was, do good, make good. Osborne brought the Mutual Welfare League to Sing Sing after he was named warden there in 1914. He believed these men could get some hope and a better life, not through penitence, but through music, baseball, theater productions, I think the girls and boys are sure. And vocational courses like knitting that taught the men a skill more useful than smashing rocks. But as Eliza Farnham could have told Osborne, radical change isn't for everyone. The convicts loved their warden, the status quo not so much. Osborne was accused of coddling the men and in 1915 indicted on trumped up charges. Acquitted, he returned to a hero's welcome but resigned three months later. Yet the question he asked still begged answering, shall our prisons be scrap heaps or human repair shops? A new warden aptly named Lewis Laws answered that question with his own Hollywood twist. His tenure as Sing Sing warden lasted 21 years, the longest by far. Laws continued Osborne's reforms and expanded them. Like Osborne, he did not believe in the death penalty, though he had no choice but to oversee the executions 
303 in total. If Law's story reads like a movie script, that's because it was. Starting with 20,000 years at Sing Sing, based on his 1932 memoir, Laws mined his job and his prisoners for a stream of books and films, many of them shot at the prison, using convicts as extras. It was as if the real criminals entered through the front gates and exited out the back as James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart. Warner Brothers made so many movies there that they built the men a new gym as thanks. Laws also believed that competitive sports gave the men an energetic outlet. The basketball, football, and especially baseball teams attracted hordes of spectators from the other side of the walls. This is a crowd waiting to get into a game in the 1930s. I wonder if they had to take their shoes off. <laughs> the teams played on Law's Field. The baseball team called itself the Black Sheep. They played everyone from the New York Yankees to the Brooklyn Democratic League. Come, come back any time, they told their opponents. We're always at home. <laughs> the Law's legacy that affects Sing Sing the most today is the new prison that was built during his tenure on the hill above the old one. It went from this to this. Cell Block A at the time was the largest in the world the size of two football fields. You could call it the bigger house. Cells that were new in 1935 are old now, but at least they have toilets and cold running water and even televisions. Around World War II, the 1925 cell block was finally closed and its iron doors used for scrap for the war effort. It had been in continuous use for 120 years. Another thing that dramatically changed life inside the walls was the repeal of the death penalty in New York State in 1965. The last person to die in Sing Sing's electric chair was Eddie Lee Mays in 1963. He shot and killed a woman named Maria Marini during a holdup in a Harlem bar. His death, the New York Times said, attracted little attention. The New York State prison system is the fourth largest in the country behind te California, Texas, and Florida. Today, Sing Sing Correctional Facility is the most progressive prison in New York State. There are 650 corrections officers. There are approximately 1,700 incarcerated persons. They receive up to 3,000 visitors per month, more than any other prison in the state, because they're so close to New York. 63% of them have been convicted of a violent crime. 24% of them have a mental illness. 95% of them will be released. 42% of those will return to prison. There are also 400 volunteers and many fine support staff, counselors, social workers, and so on. There are also about 80 high achieving uh, men who have decided to use their time behind bars to better themselves, whether it's participating in arts and college de degree programs or speaking directly to young people about gun violence. Sing Sing Superintendent Michael Capra is the latest in a series of wardens who have used programming and positive reinforcement to change the behavior of incarcerated people. As he explains, get them interested in doing the right thing. That's the foundation. I say to them, who are you as a human being? If you decide you're going to take this walk as a real man, that means you have to better yourself for you, for your family, for your children. There's no one answer, there's a million answers. You've got to give them some encouragement, some hope. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And now I'd like to um, call our panel uh, to join me. Uh, Cheryl Roberts, Sean Pika, and Roger Panetta. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Please join me here. Cheryl will lead off. But I've asked them to talk about how they have become connected to the subject of criminal justice, what they're currently doing in their uh, professional life in this, uh, in this field, and then to also reflect a little bit on what we as citizens can do uh, on, on this, uh, in this subject. 
and, and also how it connects to the idea of the Prism Museum. So Cheryl, I'm going to ask you to lead off. Sure, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, I had prepared some other remarks. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about those remarks, even though I'll just talk about me. It's not so interesting, really. Um, I was a local judge, and I uh, then made me Francis Greenberger, um, and we started the Greenberger Center in 2014. Um, because of, of some personal uh, history I'll tell you about in a minute, but just having some conversations before this panel about the history um, of mass incarceration and frankly the racism in the system. Um, I really just wanted to take this time to have an opportunity to talk about that. Um, you know, just, you may have heard this statistic, but we have 5% of the world's population, but we incarcerate 25% of the, of the world's prison population. Um, and, and it wasn't always like this. In 1970, we had about 350,000 people, or 550,000 people in prison. Um, it steadily increased. And by 1990, we had 1.1 million, and today we have 2.2 million people in prison. Uh, and, you know, it's, we have 6 million people with a criminal record. Um, and, you know, you have to ask yourself, so are we just more dangerous? Are we more criminal? Or is our Americans just, you know, a bunch of lawbreakers? Um, not so. It turns out it's the policies that we all support. It's the policies that our elected representatives put in place that have caused mass incarceration. I just want to read um, kind of the polite answer to why we incarcerate. It comes from an academic study by the National Research Council. Um, that was done a couple of years ago. And they said that um, the best single proximate explanation of the rise of incarceration is not rising crime rates. We're not criminals, all of us, or many of us. Um, but the policy choices made by legislators to greatly increase the use of imprisonment as a response to crime. Mandatory prison sentences, intensified enforcement of drug laws, and long sentences contributed not only to high rates of incarceration, but also especially to extraordinary rates of incarceration in black and Latino communities. So, let me tell you that now. That's the academic you know, reason. Here, here's really what's happened. Um, and after the Civil War, we had four million people, African Americans, that were free, and the Southern economy was in shambles. So what happened was that laws were changed, the Jim Crow, the Jim Crow laws were put in place, and black people were rounded up en masse and put into prison, and they became slave labor and, and built up the southern economy. This went on for about 100 years until the civil rights legislation came in to play. Um, and it was supposed to make everyone equal. But shortly after that, uh, President Nixon was elected and developed what he called the Southern Strategy. And the Southern, Southern Strategy was really about criminalizing black people uh, and drugs. Um, and, and, and if you think that I'm a conspiratorial you know, theorist, um, Nixon's Southern Strategy and the War on Crime was real. Um, I just want to read you a quote from uh, Nixon advisor John Ehrlichman. He said, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the empty war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalize them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. And it's not just Republicans, Democrats did it too. So Bill Clinton with his you know, sentencing laws um, and the militarization of the police departments fed right into that. So today we have 2.2 million people, mostly black and Latino people, in prison. And that's horrible. The good news is it's starting to come down. Um, because people like you are starting to come to sessions like this and think about it and talk about it, and we're starting to kind of come to terms with this. But what, and so while you may kind of have heard about some of these issues, what you may not have heard about is what the Green River Center does. And now I'll kind of get into what the 
you ask me to do. So while we've been incarcerating black people, Latino people for the last 40 years, the other people we're incarcerating is people with mental illness. So we used to have about 550,000 beds for um, people with mental illness in this country. We now have about 35,000. Today, if you have serious mental illness, you have ten, you're 10 times more likely to be incarcerated than you are to be in a psychiatric bed. Um, and what's happened is that the institutionalization has closed the beds. Um, Well-meaning, Kennedy did it in the 60s. Uh, his sister had been lobotomized. He understood these issues. He knew there was a problem. He thought psychotropic drugs and therapy was going to help people have a better life. The problem was the community-based facilities weren't funded, and the fact is psychotropic drugs don't work on everybody. And so people came out, there was no reentry plan for them, they came out, there were no beds, uh, and then the Vietnam War came, and the funding was shifted to the Vietnam War, and then Reagan actually uh, made it into a block grant program. So all that money was put into other places, but not the seriously mentally ill, who ended up either homeless or frankly in prison, because they were engaging in activities that were related to quality of life crimes that people couldn't tolerate, and so they became, they, they became a problem. Police were called, they were arrested. And today, about half the people of the 2.2, of about 1 million of those have mental illness, and about 390 or so have serious mental illness. So we are incarcerating black, brown people and mentally ill people, and um, it really is time to change that. So I'm so glad that you're all here. The Greenberger Center is trying to change at least a piece of that related to mental illness. We've developed a first of its kind model in the country. We're trying to get funding for it for people who have serious mental illness who have been charged with a felony of a crime. <clears throat> Excuse me, these are people who don't belong in prison. But they're going to prison because there's no alternative. So um, I can get into the details if, if, you know, if there's time. But it's a kind of facility where they'll do up to two years of treatment. Uh, and then uh, it's part of a mandated um, plea with the judge eventually be released into the community in a stepped down um, capacity. So um, the last thing I'll say is we got involved with this because Francis Greenberger's son um, had mental, has mental illness, his oldest son. And he was incarcerated. Um, he ended up serving five years um, because he, he um, had two felonies. One was he tried to rob a cab, even though his father's a millionaire, billionaire. You know, he could have had the money, but he just impulsively, his mental illness, um, you know, he just wasn't thinking clearly. He also has a co occurring drug addiction, which many uh, people with mental illness have. So, very briefly, he was out on bail. He became paranoid that a drug dealer was after him. He called the police to help him. Uh, the police came and they saw his African American and Hispanic caregiver. And they assumed that those were the drug dealers. They put handcuffs on them, went upstairs to see Morgan, realized what had happened, and decided, hmm, let's go let those people out of their cuffs. And they left. Well, Morgan was still in a panic, so he decided, I'm going to call the fire department. So he set a fire on his stove, watched it burn, called the fire department. They came, and he was arrested for arson. Because he knew that his caregivers were downstairs, it's a violent person. It's a violent felony. And so there was no one that would take someone with a violent felony and a mental illness in an alternative, alternative to an incarceration program. So Morgan took a plea of five years. He was at uh, Sing Sing at times. He went around because he kept getting into trouble. Because people with mental illness get into trouble when they're in prison. They can't follow rules. Um, and to make a long story short, we couldn't help Morgan, but we were trying to help the next kid who does this. So. I think I'm probably out of time. Thank you very much for letting me tell you about mass incarceration, but I felt it was really important. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And we'll have a chance to, you'll have a chance to uh, answer questions uh, following other comments. Sean Pika, um, the executive director for the past 10 years at the Hudson Link for Higher Education Prison Program. Sean. Talk a little bit about your program. Sure. Uh, Hudson Lake for Higher Education. Hudson Lake for Higher Education is a college program that operates in six prisons in New York. We have 588 men and women working in medium and maximum security prisons. Um, we started after 1994 when the Pell uh, 
Pell Grants were uh, funding these programs all over the country. There were over 300 uh, programs like ours across the country. Literally months after the Pell uh, funding was taken away, the programs were gone. So uh, in 1995, there were about 12 programs left, and then Hudson Lake was created. So from that point to now, we've grown um, almost one site a year, uh, continually operating with private funding, no longer relying on Pell and Tap. Um, we now have an alumni efforts, uh, which support the men women after they go through the program and are released. And what, what's, what's your, uh, what's your, um, your future goals? We uh, have been very lucky in the programming to be able to claim a less than 2% recidivism rate in our 19 years compared to the 67% around the country. Um, but I hate the fact that we compare recidivism with the good work we're doing. As someone that lived in prison and is now home, I don't want my success to be based on the fact that I didn't go back to prison. There's so many other things that we are uh, proud to have been accomplishing and working on um, since release. So it's kind of a catch-22. A lot of the work that we do is measured by foundations because we didn't go back to prison, but all our real successes have happened on the outside. And can you just say a word about why the prison museum uh, is connected to uh, why you feel a connection to that to that uh, this this uh, new initiative. I think for the Hudson Lake students, having an opportunity to go to school has been associated with second chances. Uh, really feeling like we've been getting a second chance in life through this opportunity that's been made an opportunity because of the community that supports it. So by relying on private funding, the men on the inside, men and women on the inside, realize that they're only getting this chance because folks care about them. And it's a kind of an odd sensation after your whole life feeling like you're alone to now know that you're not not only not alone, but the people that care about you you never even met. Um, so that has translated into kind of feeling like you have a voice for a population that's pretty much known as being voiceless. So when they heard about this opportunity to be involved with the prison museum and the project, they were honored that they would be able to have a voice in the creation of this, but even more excited to know that that voice would translate into actual uh, what it would look like in the end. Thanks. Roger Panetta, can you, uh, historian, uh, author, uh, formal, uh, I guess, emeritus uh, professor at Fordham uh, University. Can you say a few words about sure. your Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the first, first thing that you asked us to talk about is how we came to this topic. And I think that's important uh, to the issue itself. Um, I, I wrote about Dutch New York, the Westchester suburb, uh, Kingston during the IBM years, the Tappan Zee Bridge, and the Hudson River. And I published on all of those topics. And it dawned on me very slowly that I was in this neighborhood. And my instinct was to look at neighborhood history, things that were close by. And when I was teaching at Merrimack, this was right under the nose. And I began to do work on that. And I began to see the juxtaposition of those two things and their blindness to each other, almost as if they were walled away from each other, is really fascinating. So we you know, went to Sunnyside endlessly, but we hardly ever mentioned the same thing. And with all due respect, the people that Stork Hudson Valley was, Sleepy Hollow Restorations, didn't exactly mention the same thing a times. So there were two different worlds, even though they were in close proximity, even though Many European visitors who came to Sing who came to Sunnyside also went to Sing Sing. So their intellectual breadth was wider than ours was. And we created this sort of romantic haven. Uh, and that's what essentially drew me here, and I did a dissertation uh, on the history of Sing Sing in the 19th century, which is more into the book I'm working on now, called uh, The uh, Inescapable Shadow, The History of the Original Shell Selbach. And that inescapable shadow, I'll try to get to later, is really quite critical. You think a shadow is really cast from above by a second building. This is one of those anomalies in which I think the shadow is cast upward. Uh, and I would suggest to you for us to think about, and it's central to the, the validity of this museum, that the shadow, the shadow that sinks and casts, it casts over the whole issue of mass incarceration. In 200 years, between 1825 and 2025, sinks and will incarcerate approximately uh, 100,000 men, 100,000 men. They will have served 500,000 years. It has to be an enormous 
and extended on the failure of modernity. And what I wanted to start with tonight is the, I, I wanted to use a slide, but I, I, I prefer not to do that, is with the idea that they are us. They are us. And the degree to which we do not see them that way, because we see evil, and there is evil there, the degree to which we do not see them that way is the degree to which we have ostracized them and turned them into the other. Some anomaly, something other than myself. This has not been helped by the separation of prisons and prisoners from the general population. So that decisive decision in 1825 to move the prison from Newgate, the first New York State prison, which had been an enormous disaster in spite of its Quaker foundings, to move it here with all of the inherent problems in the idea of punishment was really a very important moment. That's the original of the river from Lower Manhattan to Greenwich Street, and then that simply gets grafted to here. So we not only get those inmates, we get the inherent flaws in that very institution from its very birth. And one of the things about the long, durable history of Sing Sing is how come in this country, and Sing Sing is a perfect representative of that, have we endured with this institution so persistently through valleys and, and peaks of, of reform and repression even though there is ample evidence that it does not work. Why has this become the fixated institution? Sing Sing, really, the DNA of American penal history is in Sing Sing. That's what makes this museum so critical. Looking at it and studying it carefully, you begin to see in greater depth the way in which we are tied to this. If you buy that thesis, reform becomes more problematic. It's one thing to think of it as bad planning or bad thinking or poor administration. It's another thing to accede to the notion that it is in the DNA, the way racism, you know, what Hawthorne calls the sins of our beginnings, the sins of our origins, the sins of our families. Is this one of those? It is as long and as old the penitentiary really codates the founding of the Republic. It sits right alongside it. And you cannot separate the history of Sing Sing from the problems, the concerns, the anxieties we have about a Republic becoming a democracy. Indeed, if we look at the profile of inmates today, the way Cheryl talked about them, and if you look at the profile of inmates in the 19th century, they have something in common. The scale is different and so is the race. But they're all at the margins whether they be Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants, African-American immigrants, they all are at the margins. They are the ways in which we have managed the margins and continue to manage the margins. Not knowing the inmates, really. What do we see? I'm really very interested in that. What does the American public see when it, in that word criminal prisoner comes into its mind? And that scene is really encrusted by all the, the social institutions in the media, film being one of the early ones. So the public's view of who that person is, a dehumanized view, largely conditioned by outside forces and media, is really a problem in the way in which we continue to sustain a system that we think is oppressive and dehumanizing. We can't see. Thus, the challenge for any prison museum is how do you make people see it? And this is quite difficult, because what are you going to show them? Are people going to want to come to a museum that unsettles them, that challenges their beliefs? Are they going to want to leave that visit shaken? Is any museum going to court that kind of audience? So the Sing Sing Prison Museum is at an historic moment where it has an enormous opportunity to break the mold. If we look at the two best models we have at Eastern State Penitentiary, which is an old model and which is extremely subconscious about what it does and nervous about things it does that it does not do right, or things it does that really sort of skate straight along the edges, like having a Halloween night, which is the biggest generator of revenue, in which the prison is open, the museum is open, and people run through on Halloween and you come into a cell and you get scared. That does wonders for bringing us in close proximity. 
The second example, the second best example, everybody who's in the prison museum business has Alcatraz on the brain. Why? Because you have 1.5 million visitors paying $45 a pop. And it's run by the National Park Service that does not want to run it. It does not want to be in the prison museum business. So what it has done with all that money is build a refuge, a wildlife refuge, on the property. And it continues to shuttle people that way because it does not want to get into the business. Why? Because it can't manage the narrative. So what happens when you go to Alcatraz? You see Al Capone. And you can go into the cell and take a picture. Now, my goal here is engagement of the public with the average criminal life. Not the sort of, what I think the entertainment issue of getting that picture in, in uh, Capone's cell. The central question here, the central debate, is entertainment or education? And so far, my own studies of prison museums, they have a very hard time sorting that out. Because they're not sure about what to say. But if we want to engage with the question of mass incarceration, we have to open up the history of Sing Sing and look at the roots of that pattern. It's very critical also in talking about the other end. When inmates moved from New York City to Sing Sing, where for the rest of its history over 75% of the inmates will be urban residents, they separate those inmates from their environment, from their family, from all their connections. They also make the prison invisible. And in that invisibility, the public begins to imagine all kinds of things. In the early part of the 19th century, more people came and visited. By the end of the 19th century, it's increasingly becoming invisible, and therefore, I can imagine all horror stories there. And in that void, the media comes. Sing Sing is really a wonderful case study. It is both a place where films are made, it's a place that is the subject of films. It is a place where there is audience. Lewis Laws is showing films five times a week. Five times a week. Because it's a wonderful distraction. It's a placebo. It takes the edge off. And so it's a place where films are made, where it's also films are being shown, and surprise, surprise, some inmates are even asked for critiques of films. So what is that tight connection between films and sex? And what does that tell us about its place in the public imagination? So I think the central question here is how we are going to do this. And I, I, it's not my business, but I worked on this in 1999, and we made a presentation to the Department of Correction. The real fear in the room was what was going to happen on Sunday when inmates, visitors, and family were on the same Metro North train as visitors to the museum? Or how are we going to prevent people from jumping into the electric chair for a selfie? And this was a real question because for 25 cents, you could sit in an electric chair in the White Plains Gallery at the same time we were working. So there are real issues here about how deeply and honestly this museum will confront the enormous complexity of it and how it begin to unpack the problems of, of, of mass incarceration, which I'm suggesting to you is much deeper in the culture than we'd like to admit, and therefore much more difficult to extricate. In a recent essay, Adam Gottlieb said, mass incarceration is the end of the 20th century's the 20th century's uh, um, pretensions to humanity. The end of the 20th century's pretensions to humanity. Uh, I think this question is at the center of our own moral self-definition. How we are going to see that, which is why I want to come back to my first point, they are us. How do we begin to see it? We need, in these prison museums, to begin to show people the average inmate we got a lot of candidates, and not the sort of glorious gangsters who simply feed you know, the, the public fascination for that kind of thing, and don't move us one inch off our standing sort of uh, uh, exercise views of who these inmates are. 
19th century Sing Sing inmates, only 7% of the 19th century committed crimes against persons. I'll say that again. Only 7% of those inmates incarcerated at Sing Sing in the 19th century committed crimes against persons. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, they were crimes against property. Their average sentence was three or four years. In some cases, the scale of the theft was so small. By the way, that's really interesting because that meant you had a revolving door here. You had about four to 500 inmates coming in and out every year, which is very interesting. So if we begin to look at that, we begin to say, I really have to get closer to find out exactly who these inmates are. One of the things Sing Sing does, and it does it effectively, and it's probably one of the best national models, it turns the prison into a laboratory. I'd like to argue with you that the creation of a criminal class with all the social science apparatus associated with it is identified with the work that goes on in a place like this. Beginning with what Dana talked about, the phrenology, an attempt to find a scientific explanation. But the place to study that is where you have subjects under your head. This is the place where we use the Batillion system. The Center for Battalion Studies in New York State is at Sing Sing. You know, where the measurements of the body, the heads, the ears, get to be more serious. This is the beginning of the fingerprinting file. It's the first psychiatric clinic in the United States for prisoners. It's here in 1917. What is all that about? To help improve the lot of inmates? Yes. Primarily to help in the identification of what a criminal is. So to what degree is the penitentiary that laboratory in which that definition is fleshed out in a scientific way? How much it helps to leave the predicament that we have met is also good. Roger, I'm going to... Uh... La my last comment about this. I think this is a, a real litmus test <laughs> and a real wonderful opportunity. Uh, the potential here to do something spectacular is right in here. Uh, that we can break new ground. And that is my fervent In the spirit of um, conversation, uh, and you've been sitting patiently waiting and listening, uh, members of the audience, questions, comments? Yes? I have a question. Um, please, please stand and say, say who you are, if you can. Um, my name is Linda Levine, and I am the community engagement librarian here in Austin. And I want to welcome you and Dana and Dana and the community I want to um, focus on a point that you mentioned about the form. There have been articles recently that talk about one of the problems among young black men is they have dyslexia. And as a result of having dyslexia, and it goes undiagnosed through junior high, high school, and as a result of them not being educated because the dyslexia hasn't, there, there don't seem to be any programs that will diagnose that they are at a direct disadvantage when they graduate or not from high school and there is more opportunity there for them to, to seek a, a, I want to say, a, a very negative path for the rest of their life. Can any of you talk about what kind of reform should take place before men and women end up in prison to give them a chance not to be there? I'm specifically working inside the prison system, but I think one of the things that's happened is the New York State Department of Corrections has done a really good job on the um, preparation of the GED and high school diploma, as well as the getting that diploma and then shepherding them to the college programs. There's 27 uh, college programs in the New York State Department of Corrections that offer full degree granting opportunity. Then the Department of Corrections has utilized our students after completion to then work with those other students to, to find them in the cell blocks and push them towards getting an education. Many of our students, when first hearing about having a, an opportunity to go to college while incarcerated, are the first in their family to get that opportunity, but also don't feel they're capable. So um, the ones that have already gotten their degree and not gone home, because there's no correlation between finishing the diploma and going home, they're utilized by the Department of Corrections to help kind of sort out some of these other educational programs while all that's May I have your attention, please? 
The library will be closing in a half hour. Please note that the computers will be shutting down in about 15 minutes. Please save it for all your work. The youth program that utilizes those men to interact with the local high schools. And that's the part that we're um, really talking about the connection between a lack of an education and being incarcerated in the first place. Can I just expand your I've, I've had the privilege to, to sit in um, prisons in Sing Sing and San Quentin <clears throat> and other prisons around the country. And um, when I talk with uh, the incarcerated people, um, I'm struck by not only the educational deficits, but the trauma that they have been through. Um, every one of them has been traumatized, <coughs> as typically as children, especially women. The statistics for women are about 90% of the women in prison have had sexual abuse or physical abuse, domestic violence abuse. Um, so there are so many um, pressures and problems that come to bear on these folks' lives. And now not everyone that's traumatized ends up stealing something or ends up hurting other people, obviously, but the fact is, without exception, almost people that are incarcerated have had very traumatic lives. Dyslexia is important, but I think uh, interventions at school, right from early on, when these things are happening, um, we need to be more vigilant about it and get help to these kids before they become adults. Yeah, yes. I think it also raises, the, for me anyway, it resonates with my larger concern, and that is it's, uh, they are us. And what you're really saying is take a close look and get out of the situation in which we use that broad category of criminal class, prisoner, to then uh, embrace everybody. And I think if you look at the records of the 19th century inmates, and you look at the admissions registers, what you begin to see is uh, uh, what, what Superintendent Carper talks about, really, uh, broken people. Broken people. So if we began to look more closely and got away from the stereotype and the othering, we would begin to see the kind of nuance you're talking about, and then our attitude toward punishment would really get much more complex. Yes, um, my name is Alicia Simpson, and I um, own a nonprofit called uh, the Crossover Yoga Project. Uh, What's it called? Crossover Yoga Project. Crossover Yoga, okay. And we yes. use a trauma informed um, mindfulness and creative art therapy to help kids who are um, in rehab centers up in the past trauma. So, the point that you just brought up, and also the idea about policies. You know, policies are the real issue of why we have the kids that are. Schools, um, and going into prison and having these problems because we have shaped policy um, over time to punish people, just as everyone has pointed out. Um, but when you're saying <coughs> that they're broken, I don't think they're broken. I think that they're just unable to kind of work their way back up because everything keeps fighting against them over and over and over again. And I just really wanted to thank everyone here because I wasn't aware of it before that same thing was doing. Um, so I was really like um, very moved to hear that this is happening. But we really, really need to, which you know you brought up initially, and I really think it's important for everyone to understand this. We're living in fear of everything that happens to us. We look at what's happening right now in our community and who's our president, and we are based, everything he does is putting us in a position where we're afraid of something. And then we have to change the way that we react to it because we're afraid that we're going to lose something. Um, there was someone by the name of uh, Naomi, something who made this thing called the shock doctor. So when you're putting people in prison and you're doing all these horrible things to them, they come down to this um, way of demeaning themselves like a child and they're going to do whatever they can do to come back and to um, get whatever they can so they can feel like they're regaining again their strength. So I really want to thank all of you for doing what you're doing. Um, I just, it was really more of a comment to be like, I'm really serious yes. about this, and okay. you know, would love to hear more about this, and I hope to go to more just to see all that. Um, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. We do have a sign-up sheet if you want to uh, uh, receive our newsletter or be uh, uh, more engaged. There's uh, information on the, as you leave the uh, auditorium today, uh, there's information about what the library is doing, and also a uh, brochure about the about the museum. Okay, one more question. Yes, sure. Hi, hi again. Um, Lindy lost me. Um, 
very close to the Sinti Museum, since uh, <laughs> your house in my office, and it's been a pleasure to have everybody uh, come in. And I've realized something very important in the process since, since I've been your landlord, which is that this museum is very different, as you mentioned with a lot of words, but I'm going to try to say it much with less. This is very different than anything that I have been in. It's going to be a living entity. It's going to be a pulsating, living entity where the boundaries between history, the dust, and the current, and the future is going to be a very dynamic. And I think that's sort of what gives me goosebumps. And I think that is where museum, as we call it, is no longer something that's sitting on the shelf. Museum is a life experience. And there's no better opportunity than here. It, in, it encompasses the entire uh, village. It encompasses the people who live here, the people who come through, the people who work here. It encompasses uh, inmates, guards. <coughs> and I think by doing this, as you were saying, we are, we are trying to, I can see you are trying to create a level playing field. And I think that's the most fantastic thing that I can see happening. So I am really hoping that the issue, the point of that this museum is going to happen is also coming out very strongly today. Because I think we all have the opinion and the, the knowledge, and some of it at least, of what is wrong with our system. But I think it's very important to embrace what this group has worked so hard and so long to start getting to happen. So I really hope that everyone here understands that this is a, a very big step forward. And I just want to say that it's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. Hi. Lila? I'm Lila McCall. I'm the development director at Hudson Lane. Um, I love what you said, Professor Panetta, about the, the central tension between entertainment and education. It's the same thing that I was like, thinking without being able to articulate, like what about this makes me uncomfortable? Um, so thank you for bringing that out. And I wanted to ask Sean, who frankly is my boss. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> as a, I, I know you don't speak for formerly incarcerated people everywhere, but just you as, as an individual. What could this museum look like or do that would make you feel like walking through it, like, wow, this communicates and educates about, you know, a historical institution that shapes criminal justice throughout history in a way that doesn't um, sensationalize or play into voyeurism about, like, hundreds of years of human pain. <laughs> I think for me, uh, there's a huge assumption that um, Officer Wapinski and his comrades were completely against me as I served my 20 years in prison. Um, and the fact of the matter is, New York is one of only two states that sentenced the teenagers as adults. So when I was 16 and I got in trouble in the ninth grade, I got a 24 year prison sentence. When I entered that maximum security prison, because there wasn't a special place for teenagers, I shouldn't be here in front of you right now. I should be a completely different person. If what everyone is saying is kind of true, there's a piece that's missing where the first thing the officers did was take care of me. The older men that lived there schooled me as a prison term. Um, they taught me about life and who I was. And there's this whole misconception that the teenagers are being abused by the older men. And, and just to put it in perspective, there's only 54 prisons in New York. I lived in nine Matthew Street prisons before I was 24. I have the broad view here. I didn't live in one place for a few months and get out and now write a book. And I hate to say it that way, but th this is just honest talk that I lived and was raised by the New York State Department of Corrections officers in a way that no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear that I was raised and did well. I'm not recommending it. <laughs> <laughs> not saying to send your kids there. <laughs> my mom and dad were New York City cops. I was the one that was there. My, you know, my grandmother thought I went to college. I should have been a doctor. I was gone quite a while. But the fact was, it was a very tricky place to grow up in. I had some guidance. 
And I'm not saying that all the officers were great. I'm not, certainly not saying all the men that lived there were great. I met some amazing people. And I wouldn't be who I am today if I could go to that place. You know, you know. I, I, I think that what he's saying to us, and it brings to me very critical, is how does the museum humanize the experience? And when you hear Sean talk, you get a sense of that. And I think letting that, humanizing that experience and letting it sit in front of an audience, not in a didactic way, but letting it sit and be absorbed so they leave with a much more nuanced view of what that experience is. That's, that seems critical. And I think what he's doing is illustrating what that was. Laura? Yes. yes. My name is Laura Rossi, and I have a question for the historian because I thought your presentation was phenomenal. And I'm curious your thoughts. The person who has your position 100 years from now, after this museum has been built and people have come through this village and this place, what will that person have to say about the relationship between the same, same correctional facility and well, I mean, there's a whole book to write about that, for sure. And, and you know, the village and the, and the person were very entwined for a long time. It's only in the last 30 or 40 years that it's become as separate as it is, and that for a lot of reasons, but a lot of people's dads worked as guards. A lot of people's moms worked as secretaries. Um, you know, I've talked to lots of people who drove meat trucks in there when they were 16 to deliver the meat and who played baseball, went to baseball games and played. There used to be a lot more interaction. And that ended a lot for, for, for all intents and purposes, unless you're a volunteer in there. And what I think people will look back at the, at the relationship of the, of the village and the prison, and I hope through the museum arrive at a, at a constructive and thoughtful relationship with it. Because, you know, the fact is, Austin's an awesome place, and we've got a state, you know, a correctional facility here. And some people, I remember I had a boss who said to me, you can't live in Austin. Because I worked at a fancy company. You can't live in Austin. I'm like, uh, yeah, I can, 30 years, hello. And, and um, that they will look back and they will see that maybe we will have come to a better understanding of who is there and why. And, and I would like to see there to be more of, of the residents, they don't have to, but to, to become more involved and, and more understanding of the place and not so much as a place of otherness, which it very much is. It used to be the guards. I mean, the stories you would hear, they, you know, the kids would put candy in the guards' buckets and they'd pull them up and you know, they go stand and watch the basketball. You can still watch the basketball from State Street. But it really used to be way more interaction. And I think that was kind of now, you know, I mean, Austin was called a gritty prison town, which not everybody, you know, today would like to be called that, I suppose. But we're not gritty. We still have the, the prison. Um, and, you know, it, 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 to me, you know, maybe we should look at ourselves and try and think of it in a way that we can you know, Laura, I think that's uh, the question when about... I for the reforms, I feel a little bit proud about some of the stuff that happened. You know? Yeah, I think, I think the question is a, a fundamental question about what's going to... How are we going to measure our success? How are we going to know that we achieve these goals that I, that I mentioned at the beginning? And I think that some of what we're doing tonight of, of pulling the curtain back on this story that has been really uh, invisible. And um, I think this idea of segregating the prison experience and what life is like for the average everyday prisoner, it's been so sensationalized, it's been so, there's so much misinformation um, that I think if we're successful to reintroduce this subject in a way that is, that, that talks about the moral implications of incarceration. The history, because I believe history is a resource for understanding our own times. And these stories that Dana told and that Roger is recording 
these stories are relevant. And I think we need to find a way to connect these, this sometimes brutal. We have your attention, please. The library will be closing in 10 minutes. If you have any items you wish to check out, please bring them to the circulation desk now. The library will be open tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you and have a good evening. I know that they mean it, so I'm going to. <laughs> But that's, that's what I think, the, the, and we can talk about this more after the program. Rochelle, yeah. yes. One of the things that we say at our meetings are uh, that uh, the Sixth and Prison Museum can be part of the solution. They can become part of the solution to create the change so that our lives, all of our lives are improved. They're improved because people who are exiting from prison actually are prepared to be in the world and they're productive. It's a wonderful thing to happen. That'll help everybody who's not in the prison feel safer about what's going on in the prison. I, I, so I think that being part of the solution, you know, to be able to, for history to say, you know, in Ossetia, we made history. It was changed. Well, our lives are better for what they did there. That, that, that would be the greatest. What she said. <laughs> Thank you all very much, uh, and thanks to the library.